First thing we have to do on Collider Ladies, and I also haven't done the Dice Tower in forever. I'm so excited. So I've got the Dice Tower back here. You get three rolls on it, and we start with those three random questions. Ooh, okay. I added this question to the list because I feel like it says a lot about someone. It's called Spider. Okay. Let's say you're home alone, you see a spider. What do you do? Call my mom. <laughs> I get, our house has actually a lot of spiders. I I refuse to kill them. I remember one time my, my parents weren't here. I was home alone. There was a spider and I stared at it for so long with the tissue paper in my hand. Could not, could not get myself to do it. Uh, yeah, I had to keep track of the whole the spider until my parents came back home. Fair enough. All right, second roll in the tower. Ooh, this is one of my favorite ones because this one is called Scream. And there's only one question that this could be. <laughs> What's your favorite scary movie? I don't like scary movies. I'm such a wimp and I don't have like, I don't know. I don't want to spend my time being being scared if, if I could just laugh instead, you know? Why would I do that to myself? Fair enough, fair enough. I'll give you two follow-up questions. First, what is the scariest movie you've ever seen? Um, it's not technically a horror movie. Um, Everest comes to mind with Jake Gyllenhaal. I get it. It's terrifying. Kind of, it's scary. I watched it like the year it came out and I, I don't remember what year that was, but I remember being too young and don't want to climb the mountain. I, I don't want to be like, I don't want to freeze to death. It was, it was just, it was too real. I get that. Another answer I respect greatly. How do you feel though about horror comedies, especially horror comedy musicals? Oh. What do you have in mind? Okay, so I'm giving you a recommendation because it is the holiday season now. I think you should at the very least try the movie Anna and the Apocalypse. Okay, I, I will I will take note of that. This one is Zombie Apocalypse. You can pick two co-stars from the Marvels to team up with during a zombie outbreak. Which two co-stars do you choose to give yourself the best chance of surviving? Ooh, um... Say Sam Jackson for starters, because duh. Like, if I'm gonna die, I want my last moments with him. He's also really good at finding like sneaky ways to, to like the path of least resistance to get out of things. He does a lot of his scenes sitting down, and he still like kills people. Like he did a whole fight scene where he like literally shoots the the creepers in while he's like sitting. I love that about him. I love that he will still get the job done. And, and and do it with ease. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly how useful he'll be because I don't think he likes running um, in a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> but I'm sure we'll find a way. Um, so that would be one. And then, oh, God, we had, we had a lot of good. Gary Lewis plays Emperor Droge in our film. I didn't get to spend nearly enough time with that man as I would have liked to. I love his, like, he's such a thick accent. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that I'm gonna die in the zombie apocalypse already. So I just want, I just want a good time. Sam Jackson, Gary Lewis, that's great. What, what is your personal greatest skill in a zombie apocalypse? I feel like I'm a good hider. Oh, I think I can. I've never heard someone say that before, but that actually is like an actual skill. I would assume. One yeah, of, one I'm on defense. Two. I'm not trying to. I'm, again, I can't even kill a spider. What am I going to do with the zombie? Hello, everyone. Welcome back for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night. I'm so happy to say that again because it's been a while since I've said that. And there's no better person to bring this show back with than Iman Vellani, who is a powerhouse in the Marvels. You're surrounded by so many exceptional talents in this movie. I cannot believe how many scenes you steal. Oh, my God. Um, neither can I. I. I was like on cloud nine filming half of this movie that just seeing all the the ways people are responding to Kamala is like truly, it, it makes me so happy. What is the movie you watched, the personal experience you had, the performance you saw, you name it, that first made you say to yourself, I have to be an actor? Uh, I mean, I, I never really wanted to be an actor. This kind of just happened because of how much I love Ms. Marvel. Um, I, I did, I did want to do something in film. I knew that. I think, I mean, Iron Man is such a big, mo a big movie in, in my life. It's, I, I watch it every time something happens. Every time I need a pinch myself moment, I will be rewatching Iron Man. 
it just it, it's such a good movie and and it's a start of the mcu um so that one i, I hold a lot of meaning to a lot of honestly john hughes movies maybe i love breakfast club um i think after watching breakfast club when i was in high school i just really wanted to i was like I, it would be so fun to film a movie with like you know five other like teenagers running around school like i i wanted that um so maybe maybe one day i'll get my indie moment <laughs> you mentioning that you just knew you wanted to be in film in general is making me want to go back to one other dicey question that was actually captain marvel uh the marvels inspired it was the body swap idea yeah if you could swap places with two mm. other people on the marvel set to walk in their shoes and learn more about their jobs, what two people would you pick and why? That's a good question. Um, there, there are points where I wish I was Mia, but then I see how much stress she's under. And I'm like, do, do I want to do that? I think I kind of want a life as well. Um, but I, I did like, that. there are moments where I'm like, oh, I wish I had the creative control over someone like Mia, but even more creative control, you know? The, the the producer trio at the top um i don't know i like i like making the last minute decision so so i don't want to say kevin feige because that's like too much um just just below kevin maybe <laughs> whoever's there i get that answer so so much every single time i'm like i just want to rise in the ladder but like i never want to be at the tippy top no that I seems like awful it's too much pressure and I feel like it's the folks just below that get I know I want to be hands on but and I don't want to be doing paperwork um Tara our VFX supervisor also has the coolest job ever mm. I spent a lot of time with her because we were you know figure out figuring out Kamala's powers and now that she's like advanced a lot from our TV show we we're like okay what kind of moves can she do now how can we utilize her powers so that it's like a little a little different from the show um and and works well with with our like team up uh fight teams so yeah she she's awesome and and she has so much knowledge i love those picks i'll i'll go to a kevin feige question because i know you were a really big fan of his before even being cast yes. as miss marvel so how have how has things changed after getting to work with him what are some things that he does that you never even realized he did and maybe made you appreciate him even more um he eats food like a normal person it's crazy <laughs> I remember he came to visit the Marvels one day and it, it was actually my birthday that day and all, already so strange to have like Sam Jackson, Brie Larson, Kevin, like all the people I adore singing me happy birthday. And then Kevin invites me for lunch in his trailer and I was like, oh my God. Um, he takes off his baseball cap. He, he has a drink and, and, and he's eating his meal and I was so like, I couldn't even touch my food. I was like, who are you? When did you become a human being? Was this always the case? Um, yeah, it's very, it's very strange to like, the more I talk to him, the more uh, I, I humanize him. And, and we are like now at a point where we're having conversations outside of the MCU, like actually two people talking about their interests and in pop culture. And it's so freaking refreshing that he's, you know, in, in my life beyond just like being my boss, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that relationship. I love the, uh, just eating food answer. <laughs> I feel like this is the most obnoxious name drop ever, but right after this, I'm racing over to talk to Christopher Nolan for the at-home release of Oppenheimer. Oh, amazing. My, my top priority question to ask this like industry auteur is like, what's your comfort movie? Literally. I, I, I picture him sitting there and watching like Oscar movies all day long. I want to know like, what is that like random comedy that just makes him happy after a tough day? It's dirty Dancing. <laughs> I, dear like, God, I hope it's that. I, I literally, I was like, what, what is Kevin Feige's like, what sports does he watch? You know, wh when does he go shopping? Does he go shopping? Like watch, I'm going to post the Christopher Nolan uh, interview and it's going to be all of your questions. Just now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you go shopping, sir? Plenty more where that um, came from. <laughs> I want to go uh, back to your audition, specifically to highlight Sarah Finn, because it's the coolest thing in the world that your first big audition ever was for her of all people. So yeah. what was it about her as a casting director and what she does in that space that makes you think, I'm so glad it was her there with me in such a high pressure environment? Yeah, Sarah's very good. Like, I think she also really wanted it to be me. Um, 
because they at the end of the day casting directors they just want it to be someone like they they want the person that they've chosen to do this audition to be the person so they don't have to keep looking for more people and with Sarah I, I don't know we just hit it off on the first day before my screen test even like she called me to her office and I'm I'm thinking I don't know if she's gonna make me read scenes with her or what's gonna happen she sits me down and she's like so like tell me about yourself like what's your favorite subject in school and she just started to get to know me on a very personal level like from our first interaction she was asking me questions from everything but like marvel and and i i love that she was taking interest in me and and just making me talk about things that i was passionate about because that's like so much of kamala's character is just being a nerd and and sharing her passion and her love with other people and her enthusiasm and I think Sarah is very smart with the way she went about this entire process. And then even at the audition, I come from theater. So I, I went to an art school in high school and I, I only did theater. I never acted in front of the camera. And she was, I was, I was, I was very big with, with my emotions and everything. Cause I'm used to like, Oh, you got to play to the back of the house, you know? And Sarah's notes were always like, um, just do less. You know, if, if you feel it, the camera will see it. And her notes were so specific and so doable. And again, like I'd never met a casting director before. I'd never met a director before. I didn't know um, how hands-on it was. I thought she would just kind of be in the corner being like, okay, she's the one. Um, but she was talking to me. She wanted to get to know me. She was like giving me really good advice. Um, after every single one of my auditions, she called me on the phone and be like, you're good now. Just take your time, treat yourself. Like she made it a very real personal relationship. And now every time I see her, she's always like dropping secrets. Uh, like, oh, we're casting this person now. What do you think about that? Do you approve? And I'm like, yes, I approve. Amazing. Go shoot the movie. I always love asking people which department is most likely to like have all the little secrets. I've never heard someone say a casting director before, but that is so incredibly they know like, everything. They, they know everything before anyone else does. Yeah, I love it. I love it every time I run into Seraphin. So you brought you brought up uh, bringing a little of yourself to Kamala. So when you were first jumping into the role for Miss Marvel, what quality of hers were you most looking forward to play to playing? But then I also want to know a quality of hers that emerged for you along the way where you didn't even realize that would be so important to who she was. Yeah, I mean... The the fangirliness is what attracted me most about her comic books. And it's what I related to most outside of being a Pakistani, you know, Muslim 16 year old girl. Um, and I think I also lived in such a fantasy of my own own life. I, I, I would always say I watch my life like a movie while it's happening. I'm, I'm very like outside of myself sometimes, especially in like really crazy situations, like auditioning for Marvel. I'm like, this is crazy. It has to be a film. We are in a simulation. Um, and for Kamala, like we, we brought a lot of that um, fantastical reality in, into depicting her, her world and, and the way she lives in it. And I think a 16 year old kid who's trying to find some simplicity in her life through the Avengers is like, I every fan girl boy anyone can relate to that um so that was really important for me to be true to that because at the end of the day the, the fans are what keeps this industry going you know they're, they're, it, we're nothing without them you know all the theory videos the breakdowns the podcasts it's they are the driving force and um it, it's a lot for Kamala to represent that entire group and I think I love the way that we did it. I love the way the comics did it. And I'm so glad that they let me bring all of my nerdiness into it. There were so many times where like, we were doing a really cool scene, like AvengerCon, for example, in, in um, the show, and they wouldn't let me see the set. They're like, whatever your reaction as Iman is going to be, that's what we want for Kamala. Smart. And I was like, oh, okay. So like, we, we had a lot of moments like that on the Marvels as well. Um, but yeah, I think uh, uh, quality I wasn't expecting was how much of a leader she is. She's, I think, the most emotionally intelligent, the most mature out of uh, out of the Marvels. I would say, even though she is like much younger, um, she's very much like the glue of the group. You know, she's standing between the tension of like two grown women, adult women, and they have like years of history and experience under their belts, and yet she doesn't shy away from giving her opinion. She doesn't shy away from making the tough call, um, making choices under pressure. And I think 
that's something I really love about Kamala. She's she's one of the few characters who truly understand what it's like to be a human and the value of a human life. And I think that's because of her relationships, you know, her friends, her family, her religious community. Like she has so many people that she cares about and they kind of make her who she is. And then you compare it to like Carol, who's a lonely cat lady in space with (laughs) amnesia. You know, she's not doing anyone any favors. I don't think she's a very good leader. And I think she has a lot to learn from uh, someone like Kamala, for example, who's a natural born leader. And so, yeah, that was that was something I, I really took out of the marbles. A lonely cat lady in space with amnesia. <laughs> That's <laughs> that line. <laughs> it's so accurate. I love it. All right, I'll talk. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Brie and Tiana next because the two of them are something else. And one of my favorite things with actors in general to do is is highlight how many different approaches to the work that there are out there. So can you maybe tell me something unique about both of them and the way that they like to work that you think help bring the best out of you as well? Um, this is something like so <laughs> random about Brie. She's really good at. Um, me and Mia call it beep booping. So wh- when there's like a, a spaceship or, you know, our sets, obviously we don't have a real spaceship there, but the, the set deck people put a bunch of buttons and like to, to make it look like the character's about to start the spaceship, Bree's really good at just pressing things and making it look like she actually knows how to fly a spaceship. It's amazing. Some of the best beep booping I've seen. <laughs> I always think about that with hackers. Like when someone's playing a hacker, how do you make it look real and not just like you're I know. thumping on a she knows exa- She's like, okay, we spent too much time pressing buttons in this area. We're going to go here now. Or, or those like floating holograms. Um, you know, that a lot of the Avengers use and they're just like pushing objects in midair. And she's she's really good at that. Um, <laughs> but like, I think for both of them, they're very good at taking care of themselves. These like movies are very taxing physically and, and emotionally. So, you know, if I if I see like a, a physiotherapist or a massage person on set, I'm like, how can I get in on that? Um, they, they take care of their bodies. They, they've been doing it for a while. And I think that was something I very much took for granted on this Marvel that like my body will break if I don't stretch and, you know, like we're doing fight scenes over and over again. And it's not that the movements are hard. It's doing them for like 12 hour work days, um, repetitively. So you're like using muscles you didn't even know existed. It's, it's insane. Um, yeah. I think about that a lot with wire work. Like wire work doesn't seem like it's hard because like you're essentially being held up, but also it's like a funny feeling on the body because of like gravity pulling you down. Yeah. And after so many hours, I have to imagine you, you really feel it and take it home with you. Yeah, we had a lot of wire work on this one and it's like all core strength, especially when there, there's some scenes that got cut. Uh, we had a bigger sequence in space, but there's one point where we were literally being, we had like six wires attached to us and they would start us upright. And then as the scene progressed, it would like go into a full midair plank position and we're doing the entire scene in a plank. So you're thinking like, oh, what's the point of us even working out? Because the super suits cover everything. They can add muscle later. No, the core, the core is very important because if you cannot hold yourself up in a plank for three minutes, you're screwed. Uh, oh god three minutes it was plank. insane because as soon as you don't then you go like this and mm-hmm. no one flies you know with, with a concave body <laughs> i'm gonna be thinking about this when i do a plank for more than 30 seconds and i'm dying tomorrow <laughs> yeah be like well i'm not gonna make it in space in a super suit all right let's move over to aladna which really fascinates me what kind of conversations did you have with Nia and maybe even Tiana and Brie as well in terms of making sure that material felt grounded and also not silly? Because if I had read that on the page before seeing it come to life, I would have been like, listen, great idea. I don't know if that's going to work, but it does really, really well. I didn't realize how silly it was until people online started saying how silly it is. Like in a good way. I, I uh, because I read so many comic books, this is what I expect from comic book movies. I want them to be crazy. I, you know, comic books, you are literally, I'm writing a comic book right now and anything I say goes, like I can come up with anything and as long as the artist can draw it, it's in the story. And I love, you know, you're just like pushing the limits of imagination and um, Kelly C. DeConnick's Captain Marvel run 
has Aladna and women, it is a matriarchy. Women pick their mates and Carol fights, you know, this other woman for Prince Jan, who was supposed to marry Lila Cheney, who is a teleporting mutant rock star. Like it's insane. And I, I love that. So I was, I was out of the time of my life and all our extras, like they were trained dancers. They looked amazing. The makeup was amazing. I couldn't stop staring at people. And it was, it was, it was just such a lively time. It was also one of the few times we were shooting outside, still at the studio, but like outside. So getting some fresh air, everyone's in vibrant colors. The song is so good. Yeah, I, I was having fun. And, and Mia, like Brie, everyone loves musical theater. Like we would burst out into Hamilton like every day. So it's just, it was, it was fun. It's really fun. That's one of those scenes I'm most eager to watch again, just because I want to be able to watch it over and over, looking at like a different layer of the frame every time. Because there's there's something happening everywhere. There's yeah. so much death. Yeah. And I, I only noticed this recently until someone online pointed it out. But the way they uh, designed Aladdin is like all musical notes. And, and they and they took a lot of inspiration from just like the chords and, and treble claps and everything. And I was like, that is amazing. It's so, so good. All right. Before I go into spoilers, I'm going to ask one more question just about the future. What is a new tool in your acting toolkit that you know with certainty you can credit to your experience making the Marvels that you are especially eager to put to use on your next film? Ooh. That, I, I don't know. Uh, I feel like I was really, I was still kind of in it coming straight out of Miss Marvel. I mean, obviously, like shooting a film is a whole other muscle. Um, I, I mean, I do want to credit it to Brie and Tiana about like just the self care bit because it's like honestly something I did not like pay attention to at all. And um, I think speaking up for when, you know, like I'm always the one who's like, use me as much as you want. I'll be working for like 15 hours if you if you ask, like, use me. And people are like, no, you need to set boundaries. You know, you are not a robot. You, It's okay that you love Marvel, but like, they do not own you. Um, so I think just like setting boundaries for myself, I, I've gotten very good at t talking to people about what I need. If I need a Band-Aid, I will ask for it. I'm not going to suck it up anymore. Um, I'm, I'm human. I think just acknowledging that because I was, I was just so happy to be there that I, I really didn't care about anything else, but that is wrong. And we have rights. <clears throat> I understand that mentality all too well. It's just so hard when you love what you do so much. Exactly. Like I, I wanted to see everything and you know, it, 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 it then I started feeling my shoulders and, and you know, my, back was hurting. I was like, God, I'm, I'm 20. This shouldn't happen yet. I mean, you're putting yourself through a lot. She goes through a lot in this movie. A lot, a lot. We're going to get into some spoilery stuff right now. So I'm going to raise the spoiler warning for anyone okay. who has not seen the Marvels. Highly recommend it. Go check it out. The first thing on my list here was specifically to talk about reshoots because I love an opportunity to demystify reshoots and additional photography because I feel like they come with a negative connotation and that's ridiculous because it's part of the process. So what was it like for you going through that process and discovering the value of it and how it could take what you did before, maybe something you felt really good about, but all of a sudden evolve it so it makes the movie overall even better. Right. I mean, well, we know we're going to do additional photography like before we even start filming that amount of time is already like slotted in way before we even got to uh, production because like Marvel's been you know the Marvel method they've been doing this thing since Iron Man and and it's worked out pretty well for them so far and I think because it's like the the entire shared universe Sometimes when, you know, a Disney Plus project comes out or another movie comes out and a big change has been made in that one, now we have to change it. It's not a bad thing. They, this is like literally how it works. And I know people get so scared when they hear reshoots or additional photography. That means the movie's bad and they need to fix it. No, it's not fixing. It's part of the process. Like it's just when you write an essay, it's the editing process. You know, you're going back, you're looking at what doesn't work, what works, what's translating. Is this going to make it into the film? And like, you know, if, if, uh, 
directions have changed in, in the course of the larger MCU picture of incorporating a different character, okay, maybe we should add in a teaser for that next. Or So they're, I mean, constantly striving towards like the betterment of their content. And I think that's always been the case. It's It's not a scary word at all. It's something we knew coming in there. There's, you know, sometimes not enough time to film things during principal. Sometimes people's schedules aren't, you know, aligning. We we had two women on our sh- uh, on our show getting pregnant, so you know that's like a lot, half of the reason we did um, reshoots as well. So yeah, it's it's part of the process, and I'm I'm more than happy to come back every time they they ask. It's so important. It's so important. All right, the other really important thing I have to ask about. Please tell me absolutely everything about shooting a scene that involves a significant amount of cats. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, we had like at one point a truck of like cats or twenty cats or something crazy like that. Kittens. Um, I got to work with one named Snuggles, cutest darn thing in the planet. It wasn't even a year old. Um, <sighs> I, I was like, they gave me so. Bree is allergic, and I, I don't think Tiana ever worked with the in-person cat. So that kind of just left me, who is like, I love animals. I'll work with a cat. But we got to set, and then we just started shooting. No one gave me any instructions. They just handed me the real-life cat. His name was Tango. Um, he's my mortal enemy. And <laughs> as soon as we called action, Tango got so scared of, I think, the scene or or the shininess of my super suit i don't know what it was and it clawed me he he clawed me i still have like scars on my hand from <laughs> from the, from tango uh yeah so that's a moment where you have to ask for a band-aid um this <laughs> this doesn't really impact uh, Kamala, but did anyone ever discuss on set what inside the belly of a flurkin might like look or feel like? I mean, it is like a, a different pocket universe, I guess. So I, I, but I do wonder, like, are all the flurkins, do their insides lead to the same pocket universe? I think about that stuff a lot. I, I want to say it is. I want to, I want to, I, I <laughs> think it is. That would be- I feel like we need an entire series that takes place inside Flurkin. Yeah, world. like all the people who got swallowed at the Saber space, space Station, just like huddling up, covered in slime, um, hanging out in the pocket universe. Yeah, it's like the soul dimension, but for Flurkins. That is kind of what I'm picturing. I, yeah, that, that, that's my headcanon, at least. Um, but yeah, otherwise, we, we just have like a green stuffed animal that's supposed to be the cat. And it is a horrible scene partner because it doesn't move or react like that that entire scene where kamala screams when she first sees the cat like fake i had to do it so many times trying to get my eye line right i can't even imagine but the treat of getting to work with real real cats sometimes sounds absolutely wonderful so cute i'll end with i got two more spoiler questions for you the first one because like i know you probably can't tell us about what's what lies ahead for her but as it pertains to this movie specifically at the end of this adventure what do you think kamala thinks her greatest strength is going forward but then also what do you think her greatest weakness is like the next thing she needs to overcome to be an even stronger hero and person hmm um i think she has realized um, I think she's also still learning the full extent of her powers um, with what Darben was able to do with the bangles and then seeing how she could channel it and not, you know, explode into purple dust or whatever. So she doesn't quite know what she's capable yet. And, and you know, quite frankly, neither do we. We're learning more and more as her story unfolds. But I, I do like to think there's a future where she ends up being, you know, a heavy hitter in the MCU, an underdog. You may say oh, that, that no one expected, um, but yeah, I think she's. I think she's a very powerful person, and I don't even think she realizes it yet. Um, as as I want, I, I would wish this like mutant story would unfold a little bit more, so we understand her powers a little bit more. And and because because for me, I'm thinking like her power is the ability to shape the like nur or the the light. Um, so she doesn't actually get it from the bangle, which I know a lot of people online think mm-hmm. that is wrong. Um, but yes, I think her, what she needs to overcome, I do think she, there's some bits in her leadership that she needs to overcome. I think like keeping her fangirling to not a minimum, but 
dialing it down a bit so we can get the work done. Um, which is why I love that Kate Bishop scene at the end, because she's like freaking out that she gets to like recruit someone, but also like kind of keeping her cool. Like I want to see more of that Kamala. Okay, I'll, I was going to ask something different, but I'll go down that, that path instead. Given that ending for her in this movie with Kate and the idea of her forming a team, what do you think is something about the Marvels team that she's going to want to hold tight to and apply to her own team? But then also, like, what is something that she's watched, you know, the Marvels and the Avengers and other groups go through that you think she's going to want to do for the first time for her team members? Ooh, honestly, I think she's learned a lot more what of on the marvels of what not to do than what she liked and should bring into the thing it it was a little chaotic you know and and she ended up kind of being stuck between like bickering women who and there's so much tension between them and i think if she if she actually was the leader of the team be, and had her own spaceship and you know recruited everyone because at first carol didn't even want them there right so uh i think she also has like such high expectations for what team up should look like from reading comic books from like probably listening to ant-man's podcast and reading his book and like she's so um she has such high expectations for heroism in general and so i think she's definitely going to want to bring uh just the best version her most fanfic version to a possible Young Avengers lineup. I got all the faith in the world. (laughs) I'm so excited for you. I love this movie so, so much. I will say congratulations. Thank you for your time today. Now I have to go leave and ask Chris Nolan if he goes shopping. Oh my God, you got to talk to Chris (laughs) Nolan. I'm so that'll sorry. be that'll be the post credit scene of this edition of Collider Ladies Night. I love it. 